So in this section, we are going to revise a rapid revision of all the PYQs so that you have the correct answer of all the ophthalmology PYQs at one place and you can have a quick recap of all the questions till 2017. So, without a further delay, let's get started. The question number one is, a child in the uh, patient is coming due to the complaints of diminished vision in the dim light. So, we are having the night blindness along with the dry eyes and the rough corneal surface. So, which deficiency is associated? So, basically, this is the vitamin A deficiency. You are having night blindness and you are also having the xerosis. Therefore, this is a case of vitamin A deficiency and answer is retinoic acid. Coming to the next one, the boy is coming with a thin built subluxation of the lens, long fingers and also we are having deficiency of sister thion synthetase which amino acid should be supplemented. So, if it is a deficiency of sister thion synthetase, this is actually homocystinuria. This is a case of homocystinuria. Therefore, we are not having the enzyme which is for the metabolism of methionine. Okay, methionine gets converted into homocysteine and homocysteine is converted into cysteine. I do not have enzyme for this. Therefore, what should I give? I should give the cysteine. Therefore, and why I am having thin built and what type of subluxation I can have. So, Marfan syndrome also will have the long and spidery fingers. There also we have the subluxation. But here the type of subluxation will be inferonasal subluxation. Plus they have directly given you there is a deficiency of cystathione synthetase. Which amino acid should be supplemented? Which should not be supplemented is methionine. Which vitamin should be given along with this? We should give the vitamin B. 6. Okay. Coming to the next one, here we are having a 15 year girl who is having myopic astigmatism and she is non-compliant for the glasses. So, if she is non-compliant for the glasses, what can be done? Now, since she is less than 18 years, because she is having the age less than 18 years, I cannot do the LASIK surgery and I can, can cannot give the ICL. So, only option that I can go with is the spherical alternate correction, very, very direct, okay. Coming to the next one, 33 year female having diminution of vision on the right half of both these sides. That means patient is having right homonemus. So, patient is having the right homonemus amyanopia. Because we are having right homonemus amyanopia and it is always contralateral. Therefore, answer will be the left optic tract. Okay, it cannot be right. In the optic chiasma, we get the bitemporal. Here we will get the bitemporal hemianopia and again you cannot have the right optic nerve, it is contralateral and also in optic nerve you will get the total blindness. You are not going to get homonymous hemianopia, you are going to get the total blindness on the affected side. So, we have ruled out the other options also and therefore answer remains A only, right? Now, coming to the next, here the child is having a whitish pupillary reflex. That means the child is coming with the leukocoria. You have to think about the DDs of leukocoria undergone enucleation. So, a child who is having leukocoria and undergoing enucleation, enucleation is done for the tumors. Now, which tumors? Having the flexner winter stena rosette also. Therefore, clear cut, it is a case of retinoblastoma. Now, quickly we will see the DD of leukocoria. Most common and most severe. Basically, I am interested in two. Most common is a cataract. For cataract, I will not do enucleation. Most severe is the retinoblastoma. Yes, I can do enucleation and retinoblastoma will give you flexner winter stena rosette also, right? Coming to the next one. So, very, very important one. One month baby. Baby with the watering. Watering means lacrimation we are having. We are also having the megalocornea and you can see we are having the bilateral involvement, we are having the blue sclera, we are having the blue sclera also, we, then we are also having the hazy cornea, hazy cornea is also there and they have already also given 
to you that there is a megalocornea otherwise you can see that the inferior area is not visible so that also confirms that there is megalocornea so this is actually a case of the buphthalmos always remember the blue baby boy along with the blue is the blue sclera along with the bilateral along with the b PL card. We have the blepharospasm, photophobia and lacrimation. Lacrimation they have given. Then we have the frosted glass appearance, hazy cornea they have given. Megalocornea is again important especially if it is more than 13 mm. Then this is very very diagnostic. Next question, a female is coming with the contact lens use. Now on appearance, on one thing, uh, one appearance, you can see that you are having this cobblestone appearance, you are having the papilla, but because we are having a history of contact lens use and second, you can see there is one papilla which is more than the size of the other. So, this is actually a giant papillae which is more than 0 0.3. Therefore, it is a case of giant papillary conjunctivitis which is especially more common with the soft contact lenses. Then it can be due to the uh, sutures also, it can be due to the prosthesis also but the most common cause will be the soft contact lenses. Okay, this is how you have to differentiate between the two. Next question, we are having a elderly female. So, if I am having a elderly female, with gradual painless diminution of vision and you can see the fundus. So, uh, you can see the typical hard exudates here, typical hard exudates. They are very, very uh, smaller and um, you can see that uh, they are yellowish in color because basically they are the lipids or they are the lipoproteins. They are the lipids or the lipoprotein. So, I can clearly say that hard exudates in diabetic retinopathy. They are not soft exudates. This is wrong. They are not the hemorrhages. This is also wrong. And CRVO may you are getting the splashed tomato appearance. You are getting a splashed tomato appearance. So, you will get lot of hemorrhages here. So, they are also not visible. Okay. So, soft exudates are uh, larger and plus these are the neuronal deposits. These are the neuronal deposits while the hard exudates are smaller and they are the lipids or the lipoproteins. Okay. Now, see the next one. The given defect is associated with which complication? What is this defect? You can see this is a lid coloboma. This is a lid coloboma and um, this is most common in the upper lid and um, that too it is common at the lateral uh, two-third and medial one-third ka junction pe. This is the most common side. Now, because we are having the uh, lid coloboma, there is absence of tissue. So, more of the radiations will be going from here. Therefore, it can cause the exposure keratitis. So, it is a lid coloboma. Therefore, more defect, uh, more of the chances for the exposure keratitis. Okay. Next question, there is a history of trauma with the chisel and hammer. Chisel and hammer means it's a iron foreign body and uh, the patient states that the foreign body is entered. So, which investigation will be detrimental? Iron is actually magnetic and uh, therefore what should not be done is actually the MRI. This is again a very important question. Most of the times whenever we have a penetrating trauma, we will have iron foreign body. So, what you should do? So, it is actually the CT scan that should be the investigation of choice and how should you take the visual acuity? For visual acuity, the best is actually ERG. So, these are two more questions that can be asked in relation to this. Another important thing is that um, what should be the do's and don'ts? If there is a foreign body like this, what you should do and what you should not do. So, always take the visual acuity that I told you taken by the ERG and second, always start the antibiotics because always there is a risk of infection. These th uh, two things you should do. What you should not do? Whatever you feel like doing, don't do it. So, uh, don't actually touch the eye, don't rub the eye, don't cover the eye. Don't wash the eye and don't remove the foreign body. Okay, don't remove the foreign body. So, that does not mean that you will never remove it. You don't have to remove it there. After the localization of the foreign body, it is under OT setup that the ophthalmologist is going to remove it. So, this is again a AIMS question. This is again important. Next question, there is a proptosis 
and uh, in the child who is having desmin positive tumor so proptosis first of all proptosis is there in the child so which tumor can present as a proptosis and that is also desmin positive desmin that means it's a muscle tumor so which muscle tumor can lead to proptosis and it is desmin positive therefore it is the rhabdomyosarcoma so this is a question related to the of the with the petho so if you are having knowledge of both you can easily solve this question next question identify the site of lesion you can see that there is actually homonemus amyanopia first of all you can see here then you can see that it is actually the right homonemus amyanopia because whenever you are seeing the visual field defect your right side will be the right eye so this is the right uh, side and this is also the right side okay this is the right eye and this is the left eye field you can see so it's a right homonemus amyanopia and you can see this area is spared also with the macular sparing so you are also having the macular sparing now once you know it's a macular sparing therefore it cannot be optic asthma it cannot be lateral geniculate body now which side it is always contralateral so if i am having the right homonemus amyanopia defect will be in the left occipital lobe this is how you have to do the question go step by step and you will be there with the right answer all right now see this one most common lacrimal gland tumor so when i talk about the lacrimal gland tumor most common benign most common malignant so most common benign if i they are asking you okay then it is a pleomorphic adenoma most common malignant is the adenoid cystic carcinoma so you can give the answer accordingly next question identify the condition in the given image now usually when you get such kind of a questions they are giving you so many images you have got the nine images so how to read this always start with the primary position this is the primary image you can see and this is actually the ptosis so ptosis actually means that it's a third nerve palsy so you get some clue that it's a third nerve palsy then you can see that the eye is also down and out so these two things are usually sufficient to say that it's a third nerve palsy because at that time you may not have to waste the time looking at every image to see if you are having ptosis and eyes down and out just it's a third nerve palsy all right you have to see these two things and answer the question now coming to the next one safe strategy so again a very important thing safe strategy surgery for tracheas is okay antibiotics is okay facial cleanliness is okay so what is wrong is this one so this becomes the answer it is not the evaluation of program rather it is the environmental environmental hygiene so this is the safe strategy which is done for the trachoma next question identify the structure located at the level of the nucleus applying the muscle marked in this level so this is uh, the muscle you can see this is the medial rectus okay this is the uh, medial rectus you can see this is the eyeball medial rectus lateral rectus therefore the answer will be the red nucleus this you can see this is uh, of the plus the anatomy and this is the reason why i always teach in the integrated manner because mostly you will get questions something like this they're not going to ask directly the anatomy they are asking you anatomy in terms of ophthalmology they are asking you pathology in terms of ophthalmology okay now coming to the um, next question characteristic finding of the fungal ulcer so if you uh, even see by the diagnosis of exclusion hypopion white hypopion means sterile hypopion sterile hypopion is a feature of the bacterial corneal ulcer ring abscess always remember arc this is for a for acanthamoeba a for um, acanthamoeba is there r for ring abscess and c for the contact lenses c for the contact lenses so it is actually acanthamoeba which is associated with the ring abscess and the contact lenses d for dendritic ulcer this is related with the viral ulcer so by diagnosis of exclusion also it is the satellite lesions which are associated with the fungal and always remember f for fungal is equal to f for finger like projections it is the finger like projections and um, because of these finger like projections always we will get the multiple satellite lesions 
we are going to get the multiple satellite lesions and um, due to this multiple uh, satellite lesions and finger like projections we are also going to get a hypopion here this hypopion will be the non sterile hypopion because it is in invading this hypopion as well as non mobile so non mobile can also be called as fixed f for fungal f for fixed also so this is also fixed then next hai which vitamin in the supraphysiological doses can cause a macular edema so this is actually niacin niacin toxicity quickly we can see all the causes of cystoid macular edema first of all it is a retinitis pigmentosa number 2 uveitis uh, can be there number 3 niacin toxicity can be there number 4 it is a prostaglandin f2 alpha uh, analogs they can also cause the cystoid macular edema then we have the non ischemic it is the non ischemic variety of the crvo then it is the diabetic retinopathy it is the diabetic uh, retinopathy that is there then we have the irvin gas syndrome irvin gas syndrome means which is occurring after the cataract surgery and finally it is the epinephrine epinephrine can cause in the aphakia epinephrine in the aphakia next question prerequisite for the sympathetic ophthalmitis so sympathetic ophthalmitis is basically occurring due to the penetrating trauma it can also occur due to the perforating trauma whenever it is occurring due to penetrating trauma or the penny perforating trauma of the ciliary body now always remember what do you mean by penetrating and perforating trauma in penetrating trauma just the entry wound is there only entry wound while in cases of perforating trauma you are having the entry as well as the exit wound and if it is taking place in the ciliary body then therefore it is also called as the dangerous area of the eye because it can lead to sympathetic ophthalmitis therefore it is also called as dangerous area of the eye okay then what type of uveitis it is it is bilateral it is granulomatous and also it is pan uveitis so the type of uveitis which is taking place here is a pan uveitis next question which layer of cornea helps in maintaining the hydration hydration is maintained by the hydration is maintained by the endothelium so all the layers of cornea are actually important you can remember it it has a b c d and e and every layer has its speciality a means anteriorly we have the epithelium now what is the type of epithelium that we have the type of epithelium in the cornea is non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium right then b b is important for the baumann's membrane what are the questions that we can expect cannot regenerate baumann's membrane cannot regenerate then uh, c c is the connective tissue stroma this is the connective tissue stroma and um, this will give you more than 90% thickness so if they ask you the thickest one then this is the connective tissue stroma then coming to d d say we have the duas membrane duas membrane which is also called as the pre desment membrane duas membrane or the pre desment membrane which is considered to be the toughest layer this is the toughest layer and second is the desment membrane desment membrane was previously the toughest previously this was the toughest now the toughest is the duas membrane and also desment membrane can have the desment membrane detachment after the cataract surgery we can have desment membrane detachment we can also have the desmetocele that means impending corneal perforation and e is for the endothelium now this endothelium is the most vital layer this is the vital uh, layer of the cornea because it is having the metabolically active layer this is having the metabolism in the form of the sodium potassium pump so that is why it is able to maintain the hydration and it is also called as a vital layer of the cornea next question the presence of the extra layer of the cilia extra layer means 1 plus 1 you will have two layers so two will be the distichiasis tylosis means we will have the thickening of the 
if i am having the thickening of the lid margins thickening of the lid margins is called as stylosis medarosis medarosis means the loss of eyelashes if there is a, a loss of the eyelashes this is called as medarosis right tracheasis means we will have rubbing of eyelashes if we are having rubbing of the eyelashes over the cornea then this is called as the tracheasis so all the important terms stylosis medarosis distichiasis and tracheasis now apart from this you can also have the entropion and the ectropion okay entropion and ectropion this is a rolling entro means inside so if i am having inward rolling inward rolling of the lid margin is called as the entropion while ectro means outward so if i am having outward rolling outward rolling of the lid margin is called as the ectropion this is entropion ectropion next unilateral proptosis with a bilateral six nerve palsy six nerve so what is the most important structure in the course of the six nerve that is your cavernous sinus so if you uh, see the cavernous sinus what are the structures passing through the center of cavernous sinus we have internal carotid artery and the six nerve while if you see the lateral wall what are the structures passing through the lateral wall of cavernous sinus we have third fourth and fifth so that means cavernous sinus can lead to the six nerve involvement and it is this cavernous sinus thrombosis which is starting may unilateral and in 50% of the cases it becomes bilateral so therefore you can have the unilateral proptosis but we can have bilateral six nerve palsy okay when i talk about the thyroid of thalamopathy there will be no six nerve palsy no six nerve palsy in cases of the thyroid of thalamopathy it is having the muscle involvement retinoblastoma retinoblastoma mein there is no again six nerve palsy and the pseudo tumors may be also we are not having six nerve palsy so the most important is cavernous sinus thrombosis now what if they were also having the keratico cavernous fistula in the question so always remember cavernous sinus thrombosis and keratico cavernous fistula both can lead to one thing and um, that is diplopia both can lead to the diplopia in the lateral gaze both can lead to diplopia in the lateral gaze because of the involvement of six nerve palsy so how will you differentiate whether it's a thrombosis or it's a fistula so if it is a case of thrombosis the risk factors that you are going to get the risk factors that i am going to get is the orbital cellulitis one is the orbital cellulitis second i can get acute ethmoidal i can also get the acute ethmoidal sinusitis and um, third i can also get the involvement of the dangerous area dangerous area of the face so you have to look at the risk factors also now if it is a case of fistula usually i will get a history of trauma due to which we are having abnormal connection or we are having fistula between this internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus plus you are also going to get a very important triad here of pcb p for pulsatile proptosis then you are going to get the pulsatile proptosis then we are going to have c c is for the chemosis and chemosis means edema of the conjunctiva and then we are going to get the b b is for the brew that means noise it is the noise in the head you are going to get this is called as the bandy's bandy's triad so always look at these things and you will never be confused between the keratico cavernous fistula and the cavernous sinus thrombosis next is a shifting fluid sign shifting fluid sign is pathognomonic this is actually pathognomonic of the erd now let us try to understand what is the shifting fluid sign in cases of erd basically we are having collection okay so this collection can be of e e means we can have exudates or we can have any fluid or we can have tumor okay we can also have the tumor cell so basically it is due to the collection so whenever the patient actually moves 
we can have the shifting of these things. We can have shifting of the uh, tumor cells or of the fluid of the exudates. Patient moves, so this collection will also move. That is actually called as this shifting fluid sign, very, very pathognomic of the ERT. Now, looking at the retinal dialysis, dialysis will be the detachment from the root detachment from the root of the retina that is called as dialysis. RRD map you will get the tobacco dusting sign. You are going to get the tobacco dusting sign which is also called as the Schaffer sign. Schaffer sign you are going to get while in TRD you get the T for T tent shape RD. Tent shape RD. Okay. Coming to the next one esotropia. Esotropia is associated with the hypermetropia. So, basically they are talking about the committent squint. They are talking about the committent squint. No, committent means it is non-paralytic variety of squint. So, mostly it is the refractive errors that it can be associated with. So, refractive errors can be of two types, either it can be myopia or it can be hypermetropia. Now, in myopia, there is a diminution of vision for the distance. So, these people are not able to see the distant objects in hypermetropia, diminution of vision for the near. They are not able to see the near objects. Now, because they are not able to see the distant, they will have tendency to diverge. So, they will have exo. So, they will have exotropia while here we are not able to see the near objects. So, they will converge more and therefore, we have a tendency towards the esotropia. Esotropia, exotropia is there. Next is the photo stress test. Photo stress. So, we are putting the light and we are put seeing that uh, patient is able to take the stress or not. This is actually to differentiate between the lesions of the macula and the optic nerve. So, basically if I talk about the normal recovery time, the normal recovery time for this test is 15 to 30 seconds may it should come back and uh, if there is a delayed, if this is delayed then that, that means the patient is having some macular disease. That In that case that means the patient is having some macular disease. Okay. Next question, lesion producing incongruous homonemous hemianopia with the one case hemianopic pupil. Now, sabse pehle, if I am saying that it is a homonemous hemianopia, it cannot be optic nerve, right? So, it starts from the um, visual cortex, the lateral geniculate body, the optic radiations in the visual cortex that we have homonemous hemianopia. Now, there are two things which says that this is a lesion of optic tract because it is incongruous. Incongruous in visual cortex, it is actually congruous at the optic radiation you cannot say whether it is congruous or incongruous plus the one case reaction is again found in the optic tract so you are sure that this is a case of the optic tract lesion all right next question a 65 year old male with a history of diabetes and hypertension coming with a diplopia and the squint so we are having diplopia we are having squint we are having diabetes and hypertension so basically, uh, we are having the paralytic variety of squint because why? Because this is having diplopia and diplopia is more common in the paralytic squints though it can be in the non-paralytic variety also and I am having uh, two important causes of the uh, paralysis that is diabetes and hypertension are already there. Now to confirm this, they are saying that uh, the secondary deviation is more than the primary deviation. So if secondary deviation is more than primary deviation, you are sure that this is the case of the paralytic squint. Pseudo squint may there will be and in the restrictive squint may basically here I will have no diplopia okay. I will have no diplopia in the pseudo squint. Comitant squint may and the restrictive squint may we can have but they are less common. So basically secondary deviation and primary deviation you have to uh, understand that primary deviation will be equal to secondary deviation in cases of non-paralytic squint while the secondary deviation is more than primary deviation in cases of paralytic squint. Now, you must be having some confusion between primary and secondary deviation. I know a lot of uh, students have this problem. Now, let us discuss once again what is primary and what is secondary. Primary means it is the deviation of the eye deviation of the squint eye. So, whatever is the amount of squint present in the eye that is called as the primary deviation. Secondary deviation is the deviation obviously uh, 
of the normal eye. Now you will say why normal eye is deviating? It is under the cover. So we are putting the normal eye under a test. We are covering it and this test is called as the direct cover test. This is called as the direct cover test. Then we are seeing the deviation and that is called as the secondary deviation. Let us see how. Suppose this is the primary uh, deviation. We are can see the squint and uh, we can see the 40 degree esotropia. So 40 degree will be the primary deviation and then this is the normal eye. I want to see the deviation here. So I am putting it under the cover and um, we have covered this eye. Now when I cover this normal eye, we are forcing this eye to take the central fixation, okay. We are forcing this eye to take the central fixation and when I force this eye to take the central fixation, it has to move in the direction of action of paralyzed muscle. Like if there was a esotropia, that means this eye was having the lateral rectus palsy. That is why we were having the inward squint. Now in order to take the central fixation, it has to move out and it has to move this paralyzed muscle. Now paralyzed muscle cannot move and therefore it will try to draw the energy from the brain. But brain says that sorry, I don't have any partiality because we follow Haring's law. Like it is just like parents, parents says that see, if one child um, is asking for something, I have to give to both. Okay. So Haring's law says that equal and simultaneous energy has to be given to the yoke muscles. So if I am giving the energy to the left lateral rectus, I have to give the energy to the right medial rectus also. And this lateral rectus was having the palsy while medial rectus is normal. So obviously this will move more. When this will move more, therefore I will get more of secondary deviation and that is the reason why secondary deviation is always more than primary deviation in cases of paralytic squint. Now why it is equal in non-paralytic? Obviously, see non-paralytic means there is no palsy. No palsy means no ocular limitation. So this means whether it's a primary deviation, it's a secondary deviation, both will have equal. So primary is equal to secondary, non-paralytic, secondary is more in paralytic. Now see, I still remember this is a uh, question of NEET 2020 and most of the people marked it as a trochlear palsy. If they would have said that this squint is found in, then definitely the answer was trochlear palsy, but they are saying this movement is lost in. So you can see that this is actually the movement of elevation in the adduction. And uh, you know that elevation and depression in the adduction is done by the obliques. This is done by the obliques and which oblique will elevate? It is the inferior oblique. So basically it is a movement of inferior oblique. And you know that all are supplied by third nerve except for SO4 and the LR6. So inferior oblique is also supplied by third nerve. Therefore the answer is third nerve palsy. I hope it's very clear and don't create the same mistake. Don't do the same mistake if you are getting this question. Question, okay. Next one, middle-aged woman. The female in middle-aged with the bilateral proptosis, with restricted ocular movements, chemosis and youth thyroid. Now this is again a controversial statement. Most of the students say that yes, middle-aged woman with bilateral proptosis. Bilateral proptosis in adults means thyroid of thelmopathy. But moment they saw this youth thyroid, they actually mark something else. Don't get confused. Whenever you are having the thyroid eye disease, it's common in females. Um, it is common in the middle age. But also remember that the thyroid status in 90% though it is hyperthyroidism. 90% may it is hyperthyroidism but 6% of the people can be euthyroid also. And even 4% of the people can be having the hypothyroidism also, 4%. So even if it is euthyroidism, always remember that it is a thyroid eye disease, which is most common. And uh, if you see the pathology, pathology is also important. Primarily, it is the uh, orbit fibroblast, which are actually affected. It can be the myofibroblast or it can be the lipofibroblast. So myo means secondary may, therefore the extraocular muscles are involved. And lipo 
that will be having the collection inside the orbital cavity. So, therefore, we are also having the bilateral proptosis. That is why this female will come with the bilateral proptosis along with the involvement of extraocular muscles and order is I am slow. The order of involvement will be the I am slow. So, it is actually inferior rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus, lateral rectus and then we have the obliques. Then it is the obliques. So, first muscle to be affected is inferior rectus and always remember that it is the whole belly that is affected. So, we are not involving uh, the um, origin and insertion because tendons are not involved, no origin, no insertion are involved. And what is the sign called as? Very, very typical. This sign is called as the Coca-Cola bottle sign. Coca-Cola bottle sign and see this is your uh, ophtha plus radio of the plus radio coca-cola bottle sign yes so i have shown you how radiologically also of the can be asked true statement about the kf ring so we will not uh, be going towards the options i will tell you about each statement whether it is true or false and accordingly you can go with the options because uh, there can be some uh, difficulty in recalling these options by the students and sometimes the combinations are not correct so true regarding the kf ring seen in all patients with a neurological involvement it is almost true almost true because it is actually 90 to 95 percent who are showing the kf ring pathonomic for the wilson's disease kf ring uh, is present but it is not pathonomic because pathonomic means that you do not get the kf ring anywhere else so it is found in the other places like chronic biliary cirrhosis also it's not pathonomic it resolves with the treatment this is true it is actually reversible on the treatment. All patients of the hepatic involvement is definitely wrong because only half of the patients, 50 to 55 percent patients only show the KF ring. First seen in the superior inferior quadrant, again this is true. So, you can see which combination is going right. It uh, What is true actually? So, it is um, seen in almost all the patients and it is resolving. This is also correct and then 5 is also correct. So, you can go with the options whatever is best for, suited for according to this. Next is iritis is seen in all except. Now, again I think that it should be uh, seen in. It is not all except because it is seen in all. It is seen in all and you can check, I have given you the flowchart also in the Parsons. In the Parsons, uh, if you see the last chapter, where we are having the uh, ocular manifestations of the systemic diseases, they have actually given the list of all the uh, systemic uh, drum, um, diseases where you can have the anterior uveitis, aridocyclitis or the aritis. So, rheumatoid arthritis, Bechet's myth obviously you get a triad, ulcerative colitis, inflammatory bowel disease may you know. Here also you get the um, anterior uveitis, psoriatic arthritis you already know. Like if I, if you remember we had discussed the acute anterior uveitis along with the arthritis. Acute anterior uveitis along with the arthritis. So, we have the ankylosing spondylitis there. Then uh, we have the Ritter syndrome there. We have the psoriasis there. And uh, we have the inflammatory bowel disease there. And uh, we have the juvenile chronic arthritis or the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So, rheumatoid arthritis, IBD, psoriatic. They, we have already discussed this. Um, Bechet's disease we have discussed along with the recurrent hypopion and SLE may we are also having. So, iritis is, is seen in all. So, if you have something like this, I can go with all the options. Okay. Next question true regarding the PUAG. So, what is true regarding primary open angle glaucoma? Abnormality of the trabecular mesh work is seen on the gonioscopy. Now, many of the students said that yes, it's an open angle glaucoma. So, I will get the abnormality. No, I will get the blockade at the uh, level of the trabecular mesh work. I will not get abnormality. Abnormality means I am getting some congenital malformation of the trabecular mesh work. So, that I am not going to get. First degree relatives have more chances of developing the steroid induced glaucoma yes it is um, familial so yes this is true dilatation of the pupil is associated with the exacerbation of iop is wrong this is found in the angle closure glaucoma and not in open angle glaucoma first degree relatives have one percent increased risk this is also wrong it is ten percent 
that there is more risk and visual field defect can exist with a normal CD ratio. This is true. Visual field defect can be with a normal CD ratio because if you uh, look at the triad of the glaucoma, if you look at the triad of glaucoma, we have the raised intraocular pressure, we have the optic disc changes and we have the visual field defects. So any two out of three, if they are present, I can say it is a glaucoma. So even if I am having the raised IOP and visual field defects, this is normal also, then also I can say that it's a glaucoma, okay. Next question, all of the following are used to control the IOP except. Now, this is a AIMS question and very, very interesting and many times I have given you as a poll also in classes. All of the following are used except for the dexamethasone. Many of you mark clonidine. See, clonidine, it is actually the selective alpha adrenergic drug, okay. So, if you remember, uh, we discussed it as A, B and C. So, we have the apraclonidine, then uh, we have the bremonidine, bremonidine and uh, then we have C, C for clonidine, we have the C for clonidine and I told you that it is not used clinically and that is the reason why you say that here answer is clonidine but I always tell you that the answer of a question changes with the option. You also have the dexamethasone which is a steroid and obviously you cannot use steroid to control the IOP because you know we have GTCS. So topical steroids can lead to glaucoma and systemic can lead to cataract. So topical steroids can itself lead to glaucoma. How can I use to control the IOP? So obviously you have to go with the best answer. Methazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. We have to use it. This is a hyperosmotic agent. So I think there is no uh, confusion that you can use this and you can use. So these two are not the answers. So if you were confused between the dexamethasone and clonidine, I hope you have got your answer now okay and again I will say that please read all the four options before marking the right option because you may not have seen that there is a better option available so don't go just with the first right option that you get maybe there is a better option so you have to go with that okay next one a patient is coming with the diabetes and fundus image is given what I told you about the image based question look at the image what is this? This is a fundus fluorescein angiography. What can you see? This is the flower petal appearance. So you have flower petal appearance in your mind. Then you have to look at the options. Look at the options. You have pre-macular hemorrhage, submacular hemorrhage, ischemic hemorrhage. Is it hemorrhage? No. Macular edema. Yes, you can get a flower petal appearance in the cystoid macular edema. Then you have to read the question. The patient is having diabetes. Can you have macular edema in diabetic retinopathy? Yes. Therefore, you are sure that the answer is diabetic macular edema. Are you getting this? How to do this question? Next one, topiramate causes which type of glaucoma? So, it is causing the secondary angle closure type of glaucoma. Again, you know, ocular manifestations. Ocular manifestations of the uh, drugs are uh, systemic drugs which are used are again very very important and I have uh, given you a separate video also on this. This is actually the Ofta plus Pharma. Many of the drugs which are uh, causing the manifestations in the eye they are again important. So whenever you are revising your Pharma also and if you get to see any drug which is causing the ocular manifestations please be with it and always remember it can cause another drug which can cause it this is amitriptyline amitriptyline is again important which is a drug tricyclic antidepressant used to correct the depression this can also cause the angle closure glaucoma and patient can have the acute red eye due to this Next question, all of the following are causes for expanding blind spot except it is the hyperplasia of the optic disc. Uh, if we have the increased size of the optic disc, if the size of the optic disc will increase, obviously there will be increased size of the blind spot. So you have to look at the causes which are causing increased size of the optic disc. Like papal edema, may bilateral we can have increased size, medulated optic nerve fibers, again we can have increased. Medulation means you are having the myelination of the optic disc. 
So if this is the optic disc due to the myelination, again we will have increased size of the optic disc. And open angle glaucoma appears as if there is an increase in size because we are having cavernous optic atrophy, cave-like optic atrophy. So it is actually, it is not leading to enlargement but it looks like. But if I am having hypoplasia, hypoplasia means we are having Hyperplasia means that we are having small optic disc. So, obviously, small optic disc cannot lead to enlargement of the blind spot. Rather, uh, hypoplasia. If there is a hyperplasia of the optic disc, this leads to typical double ring sign. This leads to typical double ring sign. That means you are having a small optic disc and you are having the impression of a normal size of the optic disc. This is called as the double ring sign. Okay. Next one, true or false regarding the calisian. So, if I am talking about the calisian, uh, calisian C for C, it is a chronic and it is a lipogranulomatous uh, inflammation, you can say, of the mebomian gland, of the mebomian gland and because mebomian gland is a sebaceous gland, therefore, it can lead to sebaceous cell carcinoma. So, it can affect both upper and lower lid true, but it is not painful. It is a nodular swelling and uh, it is non-separative. So, this is actually painless. It is inflammation of hair follicle? No, it is not an inflammation of hair follicle. It is inflammation of the amoebomian gland. The treatment of choice is IND. It is incision and drainage and rather we have to give the two types of incision, horizontal and vertical. So, it is the horizontal incision which is given towards the skin and vertical is given towards the conjunctiva. And uh, if I am having the recurrence, recurrence of the calisian, then this can lead to the sebaceous, sebaceous cell carcinoma. And therefore, what is the treatment you are giving? Here we are giving the intralesional, intralesional triamcinolone. So, here we are giving the intralesional triamcinolone treatment of choice for the calisian and the treatment of choice for recurrent calisian is different. Next is true or false on the glaucoma. Number one, topiramate causes glaucoma. This is true. It is causing secondary angle closure glaucoma. Topical steroids are contraindicated in conjunctivitis because of the risk of glaucoma. This is again true because... We have GTCS, so topical steroids can cause glaucoma. Letinopros cannot be used in the patients with asthma. So, this is actually false. It can be used, can be used, but with the caution you can use. It is actually the beta blockers which are contraindicated. And IOP is decreasing in pregnancy. This is again true. Coming to the next one. ETDRS study is related to, so this is actually related to the diabetes, this is early treatment, diabetic retinopathy, early treatment, diabetic retinopathy study, this is done for the diabetes which is actually a microangiopathy. It is a microangiopathy. Now, because it is a angiopathy, therefore, the investigation of choice is angiography. It is the FFA. Next one, what is the first step in the management of an 18-month child whose both eyes are deviated medially? So, always remember the order of the treatment is what? Order of the treatment is um, C O. P and S. This is for the latent squint if I am saying. So, C is actually the correction of the refractive error. So, it is actually the refraction that we are doing first. Then O is the orthoptic exercises. Then we can give the exercises, orthoptic exercises. Then we have P, P for prisms and S for the surgery. So, first step is the correction of refractive error. Second, if you are treating the comitant squint. If we are treating the comitant squint or the non-paralytic squint, then it is C, O1, O2, S and P. So, here also the first step that is done is C for correction of refractive error. Then we have O for the occlusion therapy. First is the occlusion therapy. Then O for the orthoptic exercises orthoptic exercises then we have got s for surgery and then we have p for prism so other things may vary but c remains same that is why the first thing is the refractive error testing and the fundus examination okay 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन आफ्टर कैटरेक सर्जरी इंट्रोकुलर लेंस वॉज पुट अन इवेंट फुली सो इन अंग पेशेंट वॉट शुड बी डन देन सो इट इज नेवर रिप्लेस see there is no indication for the replacement of the iol and um, there is no um, uh, scheme which says that you have to keep on replacing the iol if it is working fine if it was uneventful then obviously we don't have to replace it or we have to change it and um, when the secondary cataract occurs we can do the posterior capsulotomy so in that case we can do the posterior capsulotomy if press biopsy occurs then you can give the near addition glasses so in that case also you don't have to remove the iol so answer will be never replaced next question when should you do the fundus examination in a 45 year old female with newly diagnosed diabetes now many people say that because it was newly diagnosed therefore they say that um, after the 5 years but after 5 years is done in the insulin dependent diabetes mellitus that is your type 1 and type 1 diabetes is the early onset diabetes now if you look at this question this is 45 years 45 years is a type 2 diabetes this is the type 2 diabetes type 2 diabetes may you have to do it at the time of the diagnosis so answer will be at the time because this is the late onset diabetes if a patient is developing the diabetes at 45 years obviously it is a late onset so you have to do it as early as possible immediately ardently or at the time of diagnosis okay next question which of the following is correct regarding the image so this is again a aims question and uh, uh, here the multiple answers can also be correct okay you can see here in the first there is no light so this is the normal size of the pupils you can see or uh, both are normal then we are having the light this is the right so this is the right eye and this is the left eye so here you can see direct light reflex is present here we are having the indirect light reflex present both pupils are constricted but when you are swinging your hand so basically we are doing the swinging flashlight test which test we are doing we are doing the swinging flashlight test and we are swinging our hand from one eye to another eye and you are seeing again there is no reflex here no reflex here so this is rapd rapd means uh, it is a relative afferent pupillary defect which is also called as arjun robertson pupil no this is called as the marcus gun pupil this is actually called as the Marcus Gun pupil. It is not called as um, Argel Robertson pupil. It is named after the Marcus Gun physician. This is true. The vision is normal. This is also true. Here, what happens? It's a relative defect because it's a relative defect. So vision will be normal here, and that's why it is called as a relative afferent defect. Afferent means optic nerve. Okay, and seen in optic neuritis, this is also. True because um, when I talk about the RAPD, when I talk about the RAPD, this is actually the earliest manifestation. This is the earliest manifestation of the optic nerve defect. Earliest manifestation of the optic nerve defect. Okay. So, answer will be uh, B and D. If they are asking all except, then answer will be A. Archer Robertson pupil is wrong here. Next question, what is not to be done in this case? So, I had told you here you can see the iron foreign body, iron nail is there. So, what were the don'ts here? Don't touch the eye, don't uh, cover the eye, don't wash the eye and don't remove the foreign body. So, what you don't have to do is don't remove the foreign body. You have to do the survey, you have to do the visual equity by the... ERG, you have to do the survey, you have to do the investigation, CT scan, you have to give the antibiotics. So, what you don't have to do is removing the foreign body. Next one, the test given below. You can see this is actually the Titmus. This is the Titmus fly test. This is a Titmus fly test and Titmus fly test is used for the stereopsis. So, the answer will be the stereopsis test. So, basically, uh, this Titmus fly test is used for the crude stereopsis and the glasses which are used, these are actually the Polaroid glasses. The glasses which are used are the Polaroid glasses and uh, you can see there is a booklet and the right side pay you are having the house fly 
and um, on the left side you can see these uh, circles as well as these animals these are used for the fine stereopsis left side is used for the fine stereopsis while the right side is used for the house fly crude stereopsis next one which anti glaucoma drug will cause the hypotension with apnea in an infant so this is actually brimonidine brimonidine is a only drug uh, which is also giving you the neuroprotection so whenever they are asking you about the neuroprotection or they are asking you about the cns depression they are asking you about the cns depression in the cns depression we can have the apnea as well as the drowsiness also we can have apnea we can have drowsiness and therefore it is contraindicated in the infants therefore it is contraindicated in infants so answer is brimonidine here next question chemotherapy for the retinoblastoma so it is actually vec regimen and uh, actually vincristine and etoposide are usually known what you have to consider is the carboplatin always remember it is not cisplatin it is actually the carboplatin so answer is a here also remember the treatment regime so basically we have got the three kind of people one is unilateral small tumor then we have unilateral big tumors and then we have the bilateral tumor so if it's unilateral small i have to destroy i can uh, do the laser photocoagulation i can do the cryo if it is big i can do the e nucleation but for the bilateral tumors we do the chemo and in the chemo we have to give this vec regimen okay next question which of the following parameter is decrease in retinitis pigmentosa so this is a direct question docosa hexagonae acid this is actually the of the plus the physio this is the of the plus the physio okay next question drug used in acute congestive glaucoma so acute congestive glaucoma is actually the acute red eye and uh, this is actually a ophthalmic emergency condition it is a emergency condition always remember the first drug to be used second drug to be used and the drug of choice so first drug to be used is acetazolamide this is the um, acetazolamide here second drug to be used is the mannitol and the drug of choice is a meiotic drug of choice is a meiotic so this is pilocarpine the drug of choice so we are going to use both therefore answer is b and c next question a uh, 3 year old child is coming with the drooping of the upper eyelid since birth so we are having the congenital ptosis so we are having the congenital ptosis in the patient and palpebral aperture height is 6 mm so 6 mm means how much of ptosis we are having normally it should be 10 to 12 mm more so you can say more than 10 mm should be there while it is 6 mm so that means you are having a ptosis which is actually more than 4 mm more than 4 mm means you are having the severe ptosis so this child is having the severe ptosis along with this severe ptosis we are also having the poor lps function if i am having the uh, severe ptosis along with the poor lps function also then what is the treatment i am going to have therefore answer is the frontalis sing operation always remember that uh, whenever we are having the ptosis you can divide this into three parts we are having the mild ptosis then we are having the moderate ptosis and then we are having the severe ptosis mild may we do the fascinella fascinella servet operation moderate may we do the lps resection lps resection while in the severe ptosis you have to look for the lps function so if this lps function is good then i can do the lps resection but here where it is poor there you cannot do the lps resection and in that case we have to go for the frontalis sling operation then we have to do the frontalis sling operation okay what is the most common ocular finding in the myasthenia gravis this is a ptosis this is your ophtha plus the medicine you can get a question on ocular myasthenia gravis okay now whenever you get such kind of a question always remember 
that it is a defect of the neuromuscular junction. Therefore, pupils will be normal here. Pupils will be normal, one important thing. Second thing is that you are going to get the medial rectus affected first. So, first muscle to be affected is medial rectus, pupils will be normal. Then you are going to get two signs here. One is your lid twitch sign. Lid twitch sign. This is uh, due to the LPS muscle and another is the eye peak sign, eye peak sign. This eye peak sign is due to the orbicularis oculi. It is due to the orbicularis oculi muscle, okay. Next one, visual disturbance. So, this I told you also, this is actually a pterygium. Every pterygium will cause astigmatism. Well, every pterygium will not occlude the pupil. So, here the answer is the astigmatism and type of astigmatism is with the rule astigmatism. Okay. Then coming to the next, identify the instrument. This is a medox rod and ideally the answer would have been the double medox rod. Ideally, it is the double medox rod on this side also and on this side also, but because we do not have the option, you will go just with the medox rod here. Next one, identify the test here. Now, there is a lot of confusion because sometimes in some of the questions, they have given you only this image. If they give you only this image, then I can say that this is cover and cover test because it can be a case of the latent squint then. But if you look at this image, this is a manifest squint and um, if this is a manifest squint, you can see that here we have covered the normal eye. So, we are covering the normal eye in cases of which test? The normal eye is covered in cases of the direct cover test. Therefore, the answer to this will be the direct cover test and therefore, answer will be none because it is not given in the options, okay. Next one, esotropia is commonly seen. This we have already done. It is seen in the hypermetropia. Next one, which of the following is an example of compound myopic against the rule astigmatism. Now, this is again an important question and let's do it orally because in the exam you have to do it orally and I have made you practice it several times in your classroom also. Number one, minus two adapter spherical. So, minus two will be acting at the vertical also and minus two in the horizontal also and minus two at 180. So, if I am giving at horizontal plane it will add vertically and now this becomes minus 4 and minus 2. So, minus 4 here also and minus 2 here also. So, this is a compound myopic astigmatism and you know minus 4 is more therefore it is with the rule astigmatism. Number 2, minus 2 adapter spherical. So, minus 2 will act here also and minus 2 will act here also. Minus 1 you are giving vertically. So, it will act horizontally. So, this becomes minus 2 and minus 3. So, this is your again compound myopic astigmatism and because minus 3 is more, so this is against the rule astigmatism. Number 3, we are having C option where you are having plus 2 adapter spherical. So, plus 2 here also and plus 2 here also. Minus 2 vertically you are giving. So, I will add horizontally and these two will cancel. So, this becomes now plus 2 and 0. So, this becomes simple hypermetropic astigmatism and because 0 is more. So, again this is against the rule astigmatism. Coming to the D option, minus 2 adapter cylinder at 90 degree. So, if I am saying that minus 2, I am giving vertically, so this will act horizontally and this becomes 0. This is the D option. So, which kind of astigmatism this is? This is actually simple myopic astigmatism and minus 2 is more, so this is against the rule. So, this is against the rule. What they are asking is compound myopic against the rule. Therefore, answer is B. I hope you have understood it and whenever you practice, please practice it orally only because in the exam, you have to do it orally. Okay. Next question, the most common cause of proptosis in adults that I told you, it is always thyroid eye disease. Next question, which of the following procedures involve the glaucoma drainage devices? So, I told you this is actually sit-on surgery. Glaucoma drainage devices are used when there is, uh, so that uh, we can uh, fight with the fibrosis of the filtration blab. So, sometimes when we do the trabeculectomy, we can get the fistula closed. We can get the fibrosis of blab. So, in order to maintain the potency, we do the sit-on surgeries. Next question, uh, 
This is a two year old child presenting with the watering with the bilateral proptosis and the photophobia. Again, this we have done buphthalmos or the congenital glaucoma. Next question, the pair of spectacles shown in the picture. So, you can see that these are actually bifocals. So, they are not the progressive glasses, okay. They are actually the bifocals and um, in the bifocals, you can see one is for the distance and one is for the near and um, you can see the division also. Now, for the A fake, yeah, we don't have to give it, okay. So, we uh, we have to give the bifocals in cases of children or we give it for the press biopia. Now, when we give it for the press biopia, it is usually the near addition which is given something like this. So, basically, this is used for the children. So, answer will be here, the bifocals for the adult. A fake, yeah. Okay. Then coming to the next one, what is the angle subtended by the topmost letter of the Snellen's chart at the nodal point of the eye? So, uh, the angle subtended by the topmost letter at the nodal point. Nodal point means 6 meters because patient is standing at a distance of 6 meters and you know that each letter will make 5 minutes at the respective distance. This we have discussed so many times. So, now do it orally 5 minutes at the 60 meters. So, how much at 6 meters? So, what you have to do? You have to see how much patient is going closer. Patient is going closer by 10 times because patient is going by um, near to the letter 10 times. So, angle will also increase by 10 times. So, 5 into 10, 50 minutes. So, we have done this question also orally. You have done the astigmatism question also orally. Please try to practice it again and again. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question, what is the most common eye manifestation in the Sturge Weber syndrome? This is glaucoma. This is actually again of the plus the neuro because uh, there are certain um, syndromes which are called as the neurocutaneous syndromes. We are having the neurocutaneous syndromes in the Sturge Weber syndrome and um, we are having most commonly as glaucoma. Okay. Next uh, question, a patient comes to the AIMS OPD with the pain and we are having watering and there is an ulcer. Now, uh, whenever we say that there is a patient with pain and we are thinking about ulcer, it is usually the bacterial ulcers and this happened with this question also. But you have to see that there are rolled out margins, feathery, finger-like projections with the hypopion. You cannot have the finger-like projections in bacterial. Okay, you can have pain in fungal due to the secondary bacterial infection. So, don't make this mistake of saying that it's a bacterial ulcer because it is having pain because you cannot have the finger-like projections and the feathery projections in the bacterial. Therefore, answer is fungal. Next question, you are having something like this. So, again see the middle one, you can see the tosis, you can see the eye which is down and out and I told you if you are having these two features, it is sufficient to say that it is a third nerve palsy. Uh, next question, identify the layer marked in the histological section. So, again, this also we have practiced in the, in the classes so many times. You can see that this is a nuclear layer darkly pigmented and this is also a nuclear layer. So, that means I can say that this is, uh, this is a plexiform layer and this is also a plexiform layer, right. Now, once you know that it is a nuclear layer, it is a plexiform layer. Now, you have to see is it the outer or it is the inner. So, you can see that this is the choroid, then you can see the darkly pigmented RPE layer and therefore, this will be the layer of rods and the cones. What is this in the rods and cones? You can see the outer segment and the inner segment. So, that means now you can name it. So, we have outer nuclear, outer plexiform, inner nuclear and the inner plexiform layer. Therefore, your answer will be the inner plexiform layer. Just there are two things that you have to see. First of all, is it a nuclear layer or it's a plexiform layer? Is it the outer or is it the inner? So, this you can see uh, at the fractions of second, is it a nuclear layer or it's a plexiform layer? And whether it's a outer layer or it's an inner nuclear layer, you have to see by three things. You can see the choriocapillaries, you can see the RPE layer and you can also see the outer segment and inner segment. By these three things, you can easily find out is it the outer side or is it the inner side. Coming to the next one, tylosis. So, this also I had told you, tylosis is the hypertrophy and the drooping. That means thickening is there. 
it is the thickening of the lid margins inversion will be called as the entropion this will be called as the entropion so this will be your dialysis next one we are having a 21 year old female who is coming with the glaucoma and the bulging of cornea now again there is a lot of confusion whether this is keratoconus or whether this is staphyloma right keratomalacia and granular dystrophies are ruled out so always remember that this is a case of staphyloma because in keratoconus there will be no glaucoma you will not get glaucoma in keratoconus that is why the answer is staphyloma okay Next question, identify the pathology in the picture of RPE. So, again, this is a AIMS question and I told you this, this type of a questions were asked in 2017 and since then there have been 5 years that they have not asked this question. So, they are short, short questions, very, very small, you know, uh, important questions which we are expecting in the NEET 2023. So, you can see the histology, how can you name it now, you can see this, these are the uh, choreo capillaries that is there and um, you can see this darkly pigmented RPE layer. Okay, darkly pigmented RPE layer. So, we, the lesion which is present is between the choroid and the RPE. So, therefore, this is actually a drusen because drusen is something which are the extracellular deposits between the Brooks membrane between the Brooks membrane of the choroid and the RPE layer. You can see the other layers, see this is outer segment, inner segment, then um, you can see this is the external limiting membrane, then outer nuclear layer, outer plexiform layer, inner nuclear layer and the inner plexiform layer like this also. So, you can see whole of the histology. Then the next question, stenopic slit is used for all except. So, stenopic slit is used for the Fincham stenopic slit test. So, this is not the answer. For the excess of cylinders, for the refinement, we can use it. For aridectomy, aridectomy ke liye bhi we are using it. Therefore, answer is the tattooing. Why we use it for the aridectomy? To uh, get the right site for the opening, for right side of creating this opening in cases of the corneal opacity. If the patient is having corneal opacity and I want to find out what is the right side for creating this aridectomy, in that case also we can use this stenopic slit. Uh, next question, which of the following is used in adjuvant in the fungal corneal ulcer? So, answer is atropine eye drops. It is not only for fungal ulcers, for um, all the corneal ulcers. Basically, in all the corneal ulcers, wherever we are having the acute anterior uveitis associated with it, we have to use the atropine because drug of choice for acute anterior uveitis is the atropine, right? Uh, next question, which of the following is the is not an ocular manifestation of the dengue virus. So, answer here is the cataract. A cataract is not the ocular manifestation of the dengue virus here. These are some of the ocular manifestations that you can get along with the uh, dengue. We can have subconjunctival hemorrhages, we can have uveitis. It can be anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, posterior vitreous, even optic neuritis, disc swelling, retinal vasculitis, which can lead to vitreous hemorrhage, optic neuritis, macular hemorrhage, macular edema, and the foveal elevation. So, you can see here we can have the vitreous hemorrhage, we can have optic neuritis, and maculopathy or macular edema can also be there. Cataract is not a known ocular manifestation of the dengue. So, again this is actually of the plus medicine whenever you are learning the systemic diseases please look at their ocular manifestations also and we have discussed this in the ocular manifestations of systemic diseases in the e videos also right. Next one which of the following is the site for the lesion of internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So, this is MLF lesion whenever you are having the lesion of the MLF then always what we are getting is ipsi lateral adduction deficit. We are getting the adduction deficit on the same side and contralateral we get the abduction nystagmus, abduction nystagmus on the other side. Ipsi lateral adduction deficit, contralateral abduction nystagmus. So, whatever side you are getting adduction deficit, that side MLF lesion or that side INO you are going to get. Um, next question, we are having a 55 year old male patient coming to the OPD with a glare during the night drive and he had underwent the un cataract surgery one year back and the best corrected visual acuity is 6 by 12 and 6 by 9, no improvement in the pinhole. So, if there is no improvement with the pinhole, that means there is no 
refractive error what is the probable diagnosis so we are having diminution of vision after one year of the cataract surgery and what is the most common late post operative complication it is the pco so here we are having the diminution of vision after one year of the cataract surgery therefore we are thinking about the posterior capsular opacification which is the most common late uh, late post operative complication most common late post operative complication can be there in this patient and uh, it can be of two types it can be the somerings somerings ring cataract or it can be the elshings elshings pearl cataract and they are also called as secondary cataract or the after cataract they are also called as the secondary cataract or after cataract and usually they can ask you the treatment also that will be your NDAG laser posterior capsulotomy NDAG laser posterior capsulotomy is the treatment in both the cases uh, next question we have a five year old boy who is coming with the complaints of protrusion of the right eye so we are having proptosis 10 days with the um, no history of fever. CT scan is showing something which is very, very well defined in the orbit with the irregular mass and bony destruction is there. So, if I am saying bony destruction, that means I am having some tumor, tumor which is producing the proptosis and the tumor which is also showing the desmin. So, that means it is a muscle tumor. So, we have done this type of question before also. Therefore, it is rhabdomyosarcoma. Next question, in third nerve palsy, all of the following are seen except the outward and upward rolling of the pupil because what you get is down and the out. We are not getting up and out. We are getting down and out. Pupillary dilatation, yes, because it is a efferent nerve in the pupillary reflexes, ptosis because there is a LPS palsy and impaired pupillary reflexes will be there. But you are not getting outward and upward. We are getting outward and downward. Next question, a patient is taking the drugs for rheumatoid arthritis and there is a history of cataract surgery one year back. We are having sudden painless loss of vision. So again, this is an image based question. So I have to look at the image first. I can see that this is FFA, FFA may you can see the flower petal appearance. So once you see the flower petal appearance, you have something in your mind that yes, it's a cystoid macular edema. Now you have seen the options, yes, and you can have the cystoid macular edema. We have already discussed the etiologies. This is actually a case of the Irwin gas syndrome. This is a case of a Irwin gas syndrome. Therefore, you are sure the answer is A only. Next question. We have got a 70 years old lady who is coming after the cataract surgery and you can see something, you can see the hypopion. So after the cataract surgery, we are having hypopion that is pus in the anterior chamber. Therefore, it can be a case of the bacterial and of thelmitis. Therefore, it is a case of the bacterial and of thelmitis and you know bacterial and of thelmitis is the most severe complication. This is the most severe complication of the cataract surgery overall. So, the first thing that we do is the intravitreal antibiotics for it. Next question, yolk muscle for the right lateral rectus in the dextro version. So, whenever I want to see in the dextro version, so right ka lateral rectus will be having left ka medial rectus. Therefore, answer will be the left ka medial rectus. Also remember that uh, whenever we have to choose for the other yolk muscles, okay, whenever you have to choose other yolk muscles, you have to just flip the extraocular muscle just flip the extraocular muscle like um, if this is the eye you can divide it into the four actions something like this so we have dextro elevation dextro depression levo elevation and the levo depression so you have a uh, dextro elevation so if you will have the right superior rectus dextro depression may right inferior rectus similarly levo elevation may left superior rectus and levo depression may you will have left inferior rectus now just flip this muscle you will get what you will get right ka left superior ka inferior and rectus ka oblique this is its yoke muscle here we will have right inferior oblique here i will have left superior oblique and here i will get right superior oblique these are your four different 
most important pair of the yoke muscle so whenever you get such kind of a question just follow flipping the muscle and you will get foolproof answer right next one the vision which is last to go this uh, we have done so many times in the classes also it is a temporal field also remember the as knit as knit is the normal field of the vision so you have to remember it in this order so minimum is superior 50 degree then nasal 60 degree then inferior 70 degree and then is a temporal that is 90 or 100 degree okay remember this also a 50 year old emetropic patient what is a press biopic correction that is needed so uh, this is actually press biopia where you have to go with the age wise correction so age wise may uh, it is 40 to 45 years that you can start with the plus one diopter next 46 to 50 years ke liye, you can increase plus 1.5 to plus 2 diopter then 51 to 55 years ke liye, you can go with plus 2.5 2 plus 3 diopter and finally 56 to 60 years ke liye you can give plus 3.5 to plus 4 diopter okay now because they have asked for 50 years so basically it is plus 1.5 to plus 2 diopter if you look at the options you have plus 2 diopters you don't have to give this this is plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 and plus 4 now plus 1 if you are giving this is actually under correction so you cannot give this and plus 3 and plus 4 will be over correction and you should never over correct the press biopia therefore you will give not this also that is why the best answer is 2.5 now if i have to choose between 1.5 and 2 then obviously i will choose 1.5 but i do not have 1.5 in the option therefore i'll go with the 2 okay going to the next one in the third nerve palsy and diabetes mellitus both of them will be normal because if you remember you always write in the glasses also that pupillary sparing third nerve palsy pupillary sparing third nerve palsy is found in the cases of diabetes and hypertension whenever we have the sparing of the pupil then means that third nerve palsy is due to the diabetes or hypertension and here we are having diabetes therefore both the reflexes will be normal next question 100 day glaucoma is seen in this is again a direct question crvo next one what is the most serious cause of conjunctivitis now again there are two questions that was asked in uh, NEE 2018 they had asked the most serious also and most common also so always remember most serious is actually gonococcus which is causing the blindness but when they ask you the most common when they ask you the most common then it is chlamydia then it is the chlamydia trachomatis so please don't confuse between the two most serious is gonococcus and most common is chlamydia uh, next most common wall to be getting fractured it is actually the floor this we have already done floor or the inferior wall blowout fracture x-ray orbit water's view and the teardrop sign that we have done so this is the one most common is the chlamydia trachomatis most serious is gonococcus we have done this uh, next one cause of the given retinal image now uh, mostly you people have the problem in this also this you can see is a rod spot this is actually a rod spot you can see the whitish uh, spot so rod spot can be present in cases of the leukemia uh, why does not sickle cell anemia sickle cell anemia may you typically get this pattern this is called as the c fans c fans retinopathy so it is not the c fans retinopathy that we get in sickle cell anemia the rod spots you can get in cases of acute leukemia and um, what is this whitish area actually this is the collection of the leukemic cells we are getting the leukemic cells collection here that is why we can get this whitish area so be sure this is acute leukemia next one what is uh, uh, the example of simple myopic astigmatism simple means i have to be giving the zero power and uh, zero power means it has to be plain so treatment with both spherical lens is not astigmatism treatment will be the with the cylindrical and plain lens this can be there treatment will be my both minor so this is also not astigmatism this is also not astigmatism and you are getting 
minus plus and minus plus on both 90 and 180. So, this is again having both the powers. So, this will be compound and not simple. So, if I am having plane in one of the axes, only then it is simple. That is why answer will be this one that is B. Okay. Next question, identify the refractive error. I think it's very, very simple. You can see this is the retina and the rays are getting focus in front of the retina. Therefore, the answer is the myopia. Next question, uh, following picture exhibits which cranial nerve palsy? So, what you can see here, you can see the esotropia. Esotropia means this is the lateral rectus palsy and lateral rectus is supplied by the six nerves. Therefore, the answer is the abducent nerve. Next question, most common lacrimal gland tumor, this we have done, pleomorphic adenoma in the benign and malignant may, it is the adenoid cystic carcinoma. Next question, a patient with the glaucoma and bulging cornea, this also we have done, this is staphyloma. Next question, a 60 year old patient is presenting with the history of decreased vision and FFA shows the following. You can see we are having the neovascularization here and because of this neovascularization, answer is the PDR. We know neovascularization is the hallmark of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Next question, a patient is coming with the endophthalmitis after 5 days of the cataract surgery. So, all of the following regimens can be given except what you do not have to do. So, this patient is coming after 5 days of the cataract surgery. You, you can give the intravitreal injections obviously. So, this is not the answer. Um, Topical antibiotics can also be given. So, this is also not the answer. See, whenever there is endophthalmitis, you have to give the antibiotics by all the routes. Intravitreal antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics and uh, you have to give even the topical antibiotics, systemic antibiotics. Intravenous steroids is actually plus minus. Many uh, of the consultants feel that you have to give the steroids under the cover of the antibiotics and many of the uh, consultants say that obviously steroids should not be given. Flaring can be there. But you have to see for the parts plenar vitrectomy. Like vitrectomy is done only when there is um, uh, when, the, when there is a failure of the antibiotics and you have already repeated the two injections. Okay, so in that basis, you can go with the pars plena vitrectomy. But obviously, they have to be a little more clearer that uh, what is the uh, uh, the status of the visual acuity. The treatment of the endophthalmitis actually is based according to the visual acuity. Whether it is uh, more than hand movement or it is less than hand movement or it is perception then we have to go for what you call as a evisceration so in that case also we have to do the evisceration and not the vitrectomy that is why i think it is best to choose the past plan of vitrectomy okay next question identify the condition a very simple one you can see this is pterygium Next question, identify the test given below. I think this is also very, very simple. This is tonometry and you also know what type of tonometer is this. This is Goldman's applanation tonometer and what you are seeing is the probe of the Goldman's applanation tonometer. Next one, uh, a 60 year old uh, patient with a cataract surgery is again coming with the diminution of vision. See, after one year and I told you the most common late post operative complication was a secondary cataract to the PCO and there were two kind of PCO. What was that? One was Somering's ring cataract, one was the Elching pearl cataract. Here you can see these are the small, small vacuolated cells. So basically it is the Elching's pearl. So basically this is the Elching's pearl type of after cataract. So answer will be B here. Uh, next question, silent choroid. So, this is again the direct one, silent choroid or dark choroid is a feature of Staggart's disease and uh, FFA is actually the investigation of choice here. While what is the investigation of choice in the best disease? It is actually EOG. Next question, identify. So, you can see here we are having this drooping and uh, drooping of the upper eyelid. What is the drooping of the uh, upper eyelid called as drooping is called as the ptosis. So, answer is ptosis here. Next, visual pathway defect at the level of optic asthma. So, optic asthma means the defect is in the bilateral nasal fibers because there is a defect of the bilateral nasal fibers. So, we will have the bitemporal hemianopia. So, answer is bitemporal hemianopia. 
a patient is having a left sided head tilt so again uh, it's good that the part 3 step test has come and uh, we can discuss it again so there is a right sided hypotropia there is a right sided hypotropia or i can say it's a left sided hypertropia okay so either it's a it's a elevator palsy so it's a elevator palsy of the right eye that's why it is going into depression or it's a depressor palsy of the left eye that is why it is going into the elevation so what are the elevators of the right eye right superior rectus and the right inferior oblique and what are the depressors of the left eye left inferior rectus and the left ka superior oblique this was your step number 1 now apply the step number 2 step number 2 says that it is it is increasing in the dextroversion so try to do the dextroversion now it's going like this and it's going like this so when the patient is trying to look towards right side this i will do the adduction and um, this i will do the abduction so in the adducting i we have to choose the oblique in the abducting eye, I have to choose the rectus. So, right ka superior rectus or it is left superior oblique. This is your step number 2. And now finally, we come to the step number 3. In which head tilt it is increasing? Now, most of you uh, do some mistake here. They are saying that the patient is having left sided head tilt. This is actually the compensatory head tilt. This is the compensatory head tilt. So, if the patient is having compensatory head tilt, that means it will not increase on this side. So, if it is having compensatory head tilt on the left side, therefore, it will increase in the right side. So, it is increasing in the right head tilt. So, we will do the right head tilt here. Now, when I do the right head tilt, both the eyes will go towards left. So, this eye will go towards left and this eye will also go towards left so we will have in torsion of the right eye and we are going to have the extorsion of the left eye superior cannot extort and therefore answer will be the right superior rectus this is how we are going to get the answer as right superior rectus okay next question which of the following is false about corneal epithelium you can see the statement number one itself is uh, wrong. Bowman's membrane can regenerate. Uh, rest of the statements are the true statement. I had discussed all the layers in detail and I told you that Bowman's membrane is the only membrane which cannot regenerate. Next question, a patient is prescribed an eye ointment and an eye drop and uh, what, the, what is the advice the nurse should be given? So basically ointment is used at the night time, HS and drops are used in the day but uh, they have not given you something like this. So you cannot use ointment before because ointment is sticky. So patient will not be having uh, the clear vision, patient will not be able to open the eyes. So eye drops have to be applied first and then you have to give the ointment, that is the best possible thing. Otherwise the standard, I think the, uh, the best one would have been that you should use the drops during the daytime and ointment during the night time. So, with this we have come up to the end of the session. I hope you have enjoyed doing the PYQs and you have now understood what is the concept behind the right answers and what are the right answers. And um, uh, please see the topics also, all those topics which have been covered in the PYQs and uh, I know you will definitely come up with the flying colors. All the best guys, happy ophthalmology. Thank you.